welcome and thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, and I am here talking to you from the Foster City Library, part of the San Mateo County Libraries, where we are thrilled to be hosting three wonderful poets with different ties to the Bay Area and Foster City. Um, my name is Kathleen Woods. I'm now a library assistant at the Pacifica Sharp Park Library, but I formerly was a library assistant here. Um, and I'm excited to celebrate National Poetry Month by welcoming Dr. Praja Jain, Karen Poppy, and Julie Weiss for a reading and conversation Q and q and I hope other local writers will feel inspired by their work. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to let you know that on Thursday, May 4th at 6 p.m., local author and certified hypnotherapist Jenny Bittner will lead our virtual Relax Into Writing class that is part of our mental health awareness um, programming. And we also have other upcoming readings in May. Um, we have um, Joanna Ho will be doing a, a reading and um, we'll have a cook along from a Vietnamese cookbook memoir by VC Tang. So please check out um, smcl.org slash author talks or our events page to find out more about attending those virtual events. As for this morning's logistics, your microphone and video will be turned off, but please feel free to use the chat and also to submit your questions in the Zoom Q&A. For those who'd like to access live closed captions for this event, click on CC and then show subtitle. Um, we will begin this morning by readings from each poet and then we will move into our discussion. Uh, so first I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Pradya Jain. Yeah, she's an internal medicine physician at Kaiser Permanente in the Bay Area, California. She's been writing poetry since high school. Being a physician gives her a different perspective about people's journeys into their lives and emotions. This sensitivity is reflected in her poetry. She started her literary journey with a poetry collection in Hindi, Shabdo K. Sutu. Her work has been published in different magazines. She was a frequent guest at Akashavani by All India Radio and her book, Mon Ki Lahare was um, selected by Rajasthan Estate in India Literary Academy as one of the best, as one of the books to be published with their assistance in 2021. She finds her inspiration in different forms of nature. She's also affected by current events, which she expresses in her poetry. She believes that poetry has the power to change the world by inspiring people and instilling hope. Thank you so much for being here. We're excited to hear from your work. Thank you, Katie. And hi, everyone. Um, I am really excited to share that my book, as I, as Katie said, Manki Lehre was recently published uh, by Rajasthan Saiti Academy, and it's in Hindi, but I would like to share it with you. I translated it in English, so I'm hope, I hope I am able to convey that emotion well in English. So my first poem is, I am the breeze. You are the clouds that rain and fly away. I am the earth that soaks and blossoms. You are the sky that vanishes like an illusion. I am the sunlight that radiates in vibrant hues. You are the sea that yearns and thirsts. I am the river that flows into eternity. You are the sun that burns in heat. I am the moon that glows in the night. You are the peak that challenges my limit. I am the breeze that brushes, past and takes flight. I am the breeze that brushes, past and takes the flight. My second poem is regarding your inner voice and how your inner voice can guide you through your spiritual journey, your enlightenment. So, the title of the poem is To the Land of Everlasting Dawn. Beyond the horizons of time, breaking the myths of body and mind, a mesmerizing magnetic voice so deep pierces through our existence with secrets to keep. Breaking the boundaries of our existence, shattering the mysteries of the universe, your inner voice of hope and love ignites, guiding us towards eternal blissful nights. In rhythm with the universe, your voice of love and ecstasy fills our lives with vibrant energy. Emerging through darkness, this light 
illuminates our souls and loneliness. A fine ray of hope between to be or not to be. A leap of faith between to be or maybe. Amidst the mist of consciousness, the bliss of rainbows spread, clearing the clouds of ignorance, guiding us towards the land of everlasting dawn. Guiding us towards the land of everlasting dawn. And my last poem is about love, like nothing is kind of complete without love and uh, everybody likes to hear love poem and I also write a lot of love poems too. So the title of the poem is, You Are My Rainbow. You spread like colors of rainbow on each moment of mine to make my skies so blue and leave your hue on the canvas of my life. You smile like a dream, peep into my thoughts, sweep me like a tide, drink me like a wine. My heart sinks and my mind thinks, is this the rhythm of the universe, the music of a lifetime? Why, I melt like a glacier and tremble like a feather. How do I resist? How do I resist this vibe so magnetic? How do I look into these eyes so electric? Sometimes I lose my logic. You make me feel so cosmic. Where did you learn this magic which fills my life with heavenly music? Your voice so mesmerizing, like a stream passing, filled with happiness so pulsating, like a still sea deep, like a murmur in my silence, like a sweet fragrance and a cool breeze, it makes me freeze, leaves me guessing, and knocks at my heart, a rough sea with open arms. In the tempest of my emotions, in the skies of my expectations, amidst the darkness of bewilderness and bewilderment, you are my rainbow, you are my rainbow. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was lovely to be immersed in all those um, beautiful nature images, very evocative of the world across those poems. I think. All right. Um, our next poet is Karen Poppy, a non-binary poet. Karen Poppy's debut full-length collect poetry collection, Diving at the Lip of the Water, is forthcoming in May 2023 with Beltway Edition, so very soon. Uh, her chapbooks, Crack Open, Emergency, um, published in 2020, and Our Own Beautiful Brutality, published in 2021, are both published by Finish, Finishing Line Press. Her chapbook, Every Possible Thing, is published by Homestead Lighthouse Press, 2020. An attorney licensed in California and Texas, Karen Poppy lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you, Karen, and welcome. Thanks so much, Kathleen. I'll show my book too. Uh, this is Diving at the Lip of the Water. I think that it's showing the mirrored image. So sorry about that. You can get it in non-mirrored image and in physical copy if you order now from the publisher, Barnes & Noble or Amazon or your favorite independent bookstore. I think that it's either today or yesterday, independent bookstore day. So. I wanted to say that as well. I'll be reading three of my poems, including one that um, is about growing up in Foster City, but I'll save that one for last. The first poem I'm reading, and these are all from my book, Diving at the Lip of the Water. This poem is titled, In Case of Emergency. The poetic voice has invisible instructions crack open in case of emergency. We avoid the shards, but some cuts are necessary for we work close to the pain, closer than anybody. I'm ashamed of my own miseries, the shame of survival, of some death inside. Still, my words flare wet from my throat.
Mother's Day is coming up, so I'll read my poem titled Matriarchy. How is my life through yours made mine? Sometimes every day, several times a day actually, I'm lonely for you, your exaggerated movements, your voice in deep register, your compact majesty. Sometimes every day, several times a day actually, I'm angry at you, the richness and poverty of this gift, your voice and body, my legacy. At the end of life, sable antelope leader passes matriarchy to one female in the group who takes on her traits. That female becomes dark and bold, more like a male. She becomes exactly like the passing matriarch, although no one knows how, whether pheromones or fate. How, in sudden shift, did I become you? Your eyes flashed and turned the way their minds do toward any perceived threat, however innocent. Unable to retract my words, I suffered greatly. My mind pricked and turned the way their ears do toward the most important, pricked and turned, wanting some remnant of you, wanting our story. For nothing is more painful than becoming, than knowing the hard learning registered. The regret and anguish, anguished gratefulness forever. I felt the change even then, the moment over. How I laughed at you and said nothing. How you laughed at me and interred a twig with your shoe. A burial a planting. The last poem I'm reading is titled No One Was Gay Back Then. And as I said at the beginning, it's partially about growing up in Foster City at a time when we didn't talk about being gay and things were discussed in euphemisms and oftentimes negatively. So right now with the don't say gay legislation and various things that are going on in our country we have to be really careful where we live to not succumb to hate or indifference we have to support and stand up speak out and be allies no one was gay back then. We used to make fun of you, you making out with Michael in the grass. Fifth grade recess, back in class, you looked at me. I knew what I knew. You liked me more than Michael. My long blonde hair you pulled sometimes. Michael liked Matt. In fifth grade, already seeking cover-ups, trying to convince everyone and ourselves, our small town. No one was gay back then. The next time I saw you and Michael, lunchtime, making out against a tree, you reached around for Michael's hand, sucked his fingers with your fat lips, made sure I could see. Michael sneered, looked at me with contempt, grabbed and kissed you, I was 19 when I finally kissed a woman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the specificity of place for our discussion in the future as well. Wonderful. Um, all right. Our final, um, our third, not our third poet uh, who will be reading and then joining in our conversation is Julie Weiss. Um, Julie Weiss is the author of The Places We Empty, her debut collection published by Kelsey Books in 2021, and a chapbook, The Jolt, 21 Love Poems in Homage to Adrian Rich, published by Bottle Cap Press in 2023. 
Her poem, poem written in the eight seconds, I lost sight of my children, was selected as a finalist for Sundress's 2023 Best of the Net Anthology. She won Sheila Na Giggs Editor's Choice Award for her poem Cumbre Vieja and was named a finalist for the 2022 Seguro Poetry Prize and was shortlisted for Kissing Dynamite's 2021 Microchap series. A pushed cart prize nominee, her work appears in Rust Plus Moth, One Art, Sky Island Journal, Orange Blossom Review, Gyroscope Review, and McQueen's Quinterly, among others. Originally from California, she currently lives in Spain with her wife and two young children. All right, Julie, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with a poem from The Places We Empty. The very first poem, it's a California poem. Uh, California on fire. She can't read the words through the smoke, can't decipher the letters on the blackened sign, so she keeps walking in whatever direction feels the coldest. What good are words anyway when flames are rising out of the earth, fanning their wings behind her across the night sky? as if a thousand snarling demons have been unleashed from the underworld. What good are words when her lover's body lies crushed under fallen planks, when their faithful old hound had vanished, when all the memories they made together have been drained of color, have ruptured and lie under charred wood? The old space between the walls of her home seems so splendid in retrospect, so plentiful of life, so dazzlingly hers, that she cannot reconcile herself to the monotony of debris, indistinguishable as a pile of bones, slight enough to walk over, had her feet not been bare, had she lingered until the embers cooled. There were people who turned back, keen to retrieve any relic of their former life that may have surfaced in the aftermath. But what good are keepsakes when the baby cradled in her arms has stopped breathing? She has found a shelter where they give her fresh clothes, a bowl of soup, a mattress in the corner. She suspects their skirting protocol when they pretend her daughter isn't dead, isn't really nursing under the shawl, and the words have burned up in her throat, crumbled to ashes on her lips. She is grateful. Someone has mounted a television on the wall. She sees that man surveying the destruction, his face on fire, whether from sun or oil or plain hate, she couldn't say, but he is contorting his words. He is blaming her state, blaming her for not raking forest leaves, blaming them all as if they had, as if they had contrived the demise of their own families. This next poem I'm going to read is also a Foster City poem. Um, I wrote it for a friend of mine I used to work with at Piccadilly Deli uh, in Foster City. And it's called After Googling Your Name I, for Purple Pam. After Googling Your Name, I plod to the kitchen, gather all the ingredients, and build a sandwich you would have extolled, my knees weakening under the shock of lost time. I'm famished for 15, for my first job, how the earth never stopped orbiting your smile, even when customers stained our aprons with complaints. For one of your hugs, its galactic blaze, I'd slip my finger under the meat slicer again. I remember how you numbed my fear, wrapping your voice around my wound, kindness ever flowing like the hip hop lyrics you mixed, breast scratching your path from Foster City Catering Queen to Bay Area DJ Supernova. Every stage you crossed radiated in your wake, I read. 
but I'm 15 again. Life endless as the salads we scoop, chill as the swimming soiree at our boss's house where you pull me in, your laughter sparking mine. We glide side by side in a universe that never dies. Okay. And now I'm going to read two, they're very short, two short poems from, well, they're all short, from the Joel. And these are numbered. Uh, poem eight. In London, a couple like us was harassed on a bus, assaulted. Kiss, they roared. You're at work. I'm sitting at your desk, hardly dressed, my nipples rising under the hard mouth of nostalgia. But it's no use. There's no metaphor sublime enough to embody this morning's lovemaking. Or maybe I'm outraged by the pornography of the crime, the way words can bruise, crumple, bleed across a moment of bliss. And my last poem is poem number 17. Wait, I want to remember you like this, flushed in nothing but color, fuchsia, violet, fire orange like a dawn bride, the love we made a phenomenon of nature stirring the grass. Because not even the next minute is certain, I want to immortalize you in a thousand glorious poems. I want it all, this city, its tragedies and triumphs, the startling slash of slurs, untold wild nights, coffee and crushed tomato toast in a pretty Spanish cafe. Thank you very much. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, I, I've been noting, like taking notes of some like similarities across poems. I like, it's wonderful to also get back, get a uh, return to like a love poem in a similar way of colors and images um, to evoke that love poem idea. Um, sorry, that was not very articulate. <laughs> but, you know, we you know what I'm saying. Um, we had had a request from someone who is attending um, to hear Praja um, read one of her poems in Hindi. So we, if that is okay with everyone, we'll briefly um, hear that and then we'll go on to our Q&A and conversation. So again, please do put any questions you might have about poetry at all uh, in the Q&A for our poets. We'll all right, that. yeah, thank you. So I do believe like Foster City has a lot of Hindi speaking population. And um, I mean, poetry is beyond boundaries of language. It is the emotion people express and how it keeps you going. So what I can do is like a very short poem, but I can also translate it. Uh, like I'll speak two lines in Hindi and then in English. So it's kind of like you get the idea. So the poem is Chalte Chalo. Chalte Chalo means keep going. And when you are suffering, it's your journey. What you do, keep going. Chalte chalo, sapno par chai hai badal, or tum to indra dhanush ho. Like keep going, like all your dreams are covered with clouds and you are a rainbow. Chalte chalo ki leheru par banana hai ghar, or tum to anant urja ho. Like keep going, you have to make a house on waves and you are eternal energy. So it's hard to make like a house on waves. Chalte chalo ki dard me tap kar janoge ki tum to kanchan ho. Keep going because one, you like get more suffering in life. Then you realize burning in the suffering that you are gold. Like only when you, gold goes through the heat, it becomes an ornament. Chalte chalo ki khis khis kar mahek chao ge tum to chandan ho. Like more you rub the sandalwood, the more fragrant it gets. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Chalte chalo. Sirf chalte chalo. Thank you. Thank you very much, especially for an unexpected uh being prepared to unexpectedly read another poem it was wonderful to be able to hear um just the sonic quality of the poem in, in hindi so thank you very much um all right so we will begin our conversation portion um and uh we are hoping to have sort of a free-flowing conversation we really do invite all of your participation in the q a um so please let us know anything that might come to mind uh, my first question for our our poets um I ask partially also as a uh, Bay Area-based, born and raised um, writer of fiction, not poetry. So 
but anyway, but uh, could you talk please a little bit about your relationship to the Bay Area and to um, Foster City in particular? And we will kind of go in um, revolving order, but feel free to jump in. But yeah, Karen, do you want to begin? Sure. I grew up in Foster City when Foster City was still being built. I know that it continues to be built in many ways, and that's always interesting. When I was first in Foster City as a young child, we had many fields with butterflies and rabbits. It was a really bucolic way of growing up walking and riding my bike everywhere. I actually want to make a plug for the environment right now and say if there is anyone listening who has any opportunity to preserve any part of Foster City or any other place where they live for wildlife, including fields, waterways, any wildlife corridors, please, please do it and do it passionately. Save the earth and the animals. What I really loved about Foster City, in addition to the natural setting growing up, was the community. I grew up on a court with some wonderful friends, including Julie, who lived next door to me. Hi, Julie. And Hi, Karen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we would ride our bicycles and tricycles when we were younger um, around and go to each other's houses. Um, our parents would um, just basically let us um, go from house to house, would make us um, sometimes meals, and we would sit together, watch TV, or go out into the um, backyards and play with each other. So. It was just wonderful growing up that way. Um, and when I graduated from college, I went to Smith. I um, decided to come back to the Bay Area and lived for a time in San Mateo and then um, San Francisco. And now I live in Marin. So definitely staying in the Bay Area and always a person with roots in Foster City. Okay. Julie, do you want to jump in as you've been mentioned? <laughs> yeah, I would say ditto for everything that um, Karen has said. Yeah, I, I actually, I was born in Marin County, and I think I probably moved to Foster City to Saturn Court when I was two, probably. And yeah, I just, I just grew up there, and I have the same until I, I think I, I left when I was nineteen, went to San Jose. But um, I have the same sorts of memories. I, I remember playing kickball on Saturn Court with everybody. And um, as Karen said, riding our bikes around. And um, she said it better than I can. She just all the, the same sorts of memories, the lagoon and just the, uh, going from house to house. Yeah. So. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and Pragya, what's your relationship to Foster City in the Bay Area? Yeah, th thank you, Katie. So I have been in Bay Area for the last 20 years, and this is home. So I came to Mountain View, and there was an interesting um, association with local libraries that when I came, like I was studying for medical school, and like not medical school, like to uh, kind of do the USMLE and Kaplan. And then what happened is I used to go to a library, and I would meet people like like me and uh, get more resources on the community from the library. And I lived in Foster City for three, four years before moving to Hillsboro. And what I found is like the lagoon is so beautiful. Like it kind of blooms so nicely. You walk there. It's so inspiring and relaxing just to be in that environment. So yes, I still go to Foster City for my shopping. Even in the, even though I live, live here, I go there. Like, so, so I'm very connected here. Lovely. Yeah, that um, thinking about the lagoon and this past few months, or at least last summer, we had jellyfish in the lagoon too. Very exciting, very like beautiful and eerie to see. Um, but that kind of leads into my my next question before we'll get to our first patron question. How has this connection to the area or these things that you've observed in the area um, 
influence your writing life. Um, we've heard some of that even reflected in the poetry we've heard today, but I'm also interested in feeling drawn to capture images from this region, feeling like inspired to um, contribute images you have from other places in your life to this region. And, um, and yeah, basically the, the relationship between here and the work you put on the page. Like I always find myself writing about Redwood, like two lane highways between Redwoods, <laughs> for example. Yeah, I'd love to, uh, maybe Julie, would you like to begin? Sure, yeah. You know, um, I, I have lived in Spain now for 22 years. So there's kind of this, you know, when I, when I write poems from the point of view of an adult, really all the images are from here, from Spain. I've been here for so long. But when I write poems from the point of view of a teenager or a child, I go immediately back to Foster City, you know, to, to the schools I went to, to the places I work, to, as we mentioned, the streets and just the sort of the scenery and the landscape and every everything comes back to me, all, all the imagery and just it is sort of centered on Foster City. If it's from the point of view of a younger person. I love that that almost makes the images like a portal of time travel too. Like yeah, the sensory, yeah. the sensory world is the access point to going back into memory. Um, yes, it is. Totally. Yeah, Rajo, do you have things that uh, the area has influenced your work or those images of the lagoon have crept into your poetry? Sure. Um, thank you, Katie. So yes, living here in Bay Area, you cannot miss the beautiful nature. Like it inspires you. And uh, yeah, like if, even in my backyard, if there are a lot of Mongolia petals, like dancing, singing, you just kind of get inspired. It feels like they sleep in Mother Nature's arms. So I did write a poem on that. People around here, like I see so many strangers, patients, their journeys, that inspires me. And um, it's so interesting to kind of get into people get a peep into people's life and then it touches me and then I kind of write. So the images mostly are from here, but I also bring some cultural and um, teenager days from back home in India too. Yeah. Um, maybe if there's time, I'd love to know if you know about the Nocturnist podcast, which is like um, physicians telling stories. Something interesting it's like a it's based in the bay area but it's a like a really beautiful podcast so doctors like using art to communicate stories of what they've experienced similar to what you're talking about yeah um yeah karen has uh how has this region influenced your work being from here we heard some of that of course in your poetry i want to echo what julie and pragya have said about writing about um things, first of all, going back in time. I love the idea of writing as a time travel portal. That's fabulous. And also what Pragya said about writing about the nature. And I haven't written specifically yet about the lagoons other than I think Julie and I, we were working at one point on a poem together where we mentioned the lagoons, but um, mostly I write about uh, the ocean, and that's also growing up in the Bay Area with the ocean and the bay right near us. I've written about the bay too. One thing that has really inspired me through my whole life is the connection with the Foster City Library. It basically was a place of refuge and a place where I could seek shelter during my childhood, which was sometimes okay, often a turbulent childhood. And I especially want to thank, there was a librarian there who would steer me toward things that he thought were important to read. And that librarian's name is Conrad. So if Conrad ever listens to this, thank you, Conrad, from the bottom of my heart. I think you came on to the Foster City Library when I was 13 years old. And that was the perfect time to start instructing me on what to read because I was just a voracious reader even then and everything that has come after is because of you. I love that. I'll, I'll investigate if I can 
see if this message can can get to Conrad as well. We'll see. Um, yeah, I would love that. <laughs> uh, I love obviously I love hearing his connection to the, the libraries and even um, my journey to become to starting to work at a at a library is similar. Of going to one to do other work that was making me miserable and then being like, oh right, the library. Like people work here. <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful oh community <laughs> space that um, has been a refuge for me at very different ages as well. All right, so we have um, some questions coming in from our attendees today. Um, the first question, and um, as we continue to sort of like loop and order, Pragya, if you'd like to start, but feel free, it's okay. If, if not, um, thank, uh, the patron says, thank you all for reading your beautiful poems. How do you start writing a poem once you have an idea for one? What steps process slash process do you follow if there is one? And maybe does it change from poem to poem? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I started writing when I was in 10th grade and um, whatever stimulates your emotion or triggers your passion, um, then it flows through you and then you put it on paper. As soon as it flows and you think something is coming through your mind, put it on paper. Because if you think you're gonna like see the patients or do your routine work or laundry or whatever, it kind of goes away. So mm -hmm. better to write it then and then you can edit it later. So that's what I do. And if it's coming from your heart, it's gonna touch your everybody's heart. That's what I feel. Okay. Yeah. Karen, do you have a response for this one? My response is it depends on what I'm writing. Sometimes I write very specifically, okay, right now I'm going to write a poem or a, I'm going to write a chapter in a novel or whatever I'm working on. And it's a very specific choice. And most of the time it is not a specific choice. It is, oh, no, I'm in the middle of something else and here it is. Okay. And like Pragya said, you have to just stop what you're doing and go with the inspiration. I keep notebooks and paper and special pens. And if I'm without that, I just will grab whatever it is, a napkin, like a paper napkin or a receipt and write the thing down. There are, of course, times when I don't, and then I regret it, because if you don't, oftentimes it's gone. That's true. <laughs> right? That promise when you're falling asleep, like, oh, I'll remember this in the morning, is never true. It's never, never. true. You always never. have to just at least reach for your notes app or something. <laughs> never. Okay. Yeah, Julie, what's your response? What's your, um, when you get the idea for a poem, how do you sort of yeah. think it? Yeah, so my poems come about in several different ways. Sometimes it's like, okay, I want to write about this and I sit down and well, I start working on it. Um, I do a lot of staring at the screen, <laughs> trying to come up with something to start with. Um, sometimes I will uh, start with a first line or an image and then I don't know what the poem is about, but I just sort of keep going. And maybe I figure out what the poem is about halfway through. Excuse me. Um, yeah, and um, I think my process is not the best process. I, I write really slowly. I write line by line, word by word. Sometimes it takes me an hour to write a, a line or a half an hour to work on, you know, to find the perfect word. Uh, so I'm sort of like a perfectionist. So uh, if the first line isn't perfect at that moment, well, then I can't go on to the next line. Um, but yeah, uh, and then things that would inspire me, you know, I, if I see a news story or, you know, I have a memory of something I want to write about or an observation, um, I, I, if something comes up sort of when I'm doing something else, you know, I, what I do is I just write it in a WhatsApp in a message and then I do a screen save and then I have like a bunch of of screen saves there with parts of poems. So, but I, I have very little time to write. I only write very late at night um, when everybody's asleep. So I, I kind of force myself to, to come up with something every night. I, I can't, if I wait for inspiration, I, I might not have that, you know, chance to, 
to write when it comes about. So it reminds me of um, Toni Morrison talking about when asked what her ideal writing routine was responding. I have an ideal writing routine that I've never experienced. <laughs> that, she, yeah. you know, um, that has never been reality, right? Um, there's also what you said about sort of discovering what the poem is about sometimes halfway through. Um, sorry, I keep going to fiction, but reminded me of uh, this beautiful George Saunders um, video that I think any writer who's curious about and gets overwhelmed by the questions of writing might enjoy, but he talks about like, approaching a piece of work uh, from a place of a question and curiosity um, in that first, in that early draft and then revision as an act of love for, yeah. for writing as well. So I, I linked that in the chat in case people are interested. Um, there's also like really beautiful little animated cutout um, things in the, in the video too, it's well produced. Okay, um, another question from a patron. How do you manage to make similar but a little different? Um, how do you manage to make such beautiful pieces? Do you have any advice to new poets on how to make uh, how to make pieces and how to make poems if that person who's aspiring to to write poems feels like they cannot do it themselves? So advice for new poets who might be experiencing confidence blocks or writer's blocks or how to do it themselves. Um, I forget where we are in our like who started first order. <laughs> does, it, does anyone feel particularly inspired to answer? I can answer that. Um, it's a very simple answer. Read, 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 read as much poetry as you can. Read and then, you know, don't plagiarize but imitate or, you know, get inspired by other poets. Um, but the more I read, I think the more I read, the better my my poetry is. You know, the more other poets I read, the more I improve, and I think that's true for for all writers in every genre. Um, and just just start writing and play with the language, and you know, you ha you have to sit down and do it. Just get started and not have that sort of block in your mind, like I can't, I can't. Yes, you can. Anybody can. And you have some work that's like explicitly modeled after Adrian Rich, right? The poetry Adrian Rich, yeah. Um, that explicit homage is always like a beautiful thing to do, and can kind of give shape sometimes to an idea. Yeah, yeah. Poet, yeah. yeah. You have a answer to this advice you give to a new poet? Sure. So I can kind of figure out myself being like in tenth grade, writing my emotions. And uh, I would always feel like I'll put it in my diary and feel like, oh, it's not good enough or like, uh, you're not confident to share it with other people. So please um, don't feel like that. It's not good enough anytime. Um, it's coming from your heart. It's your emotion. It's good. It's wonderful. And put it on paper, share it with other people. You'll get your feedback and that makes you grow. And uh, then finally, keep sharing, keep writing. And the more you write, the more you realize how to channelize your energy that it's like the creative energy that God has gifted you. So keep writing. Karen, do you have advice for a new poet? If you feel that it would help you to be part of a group, there are wonderful writing groups, both online and now once again in person. I think that the library system is a wonderful way of getting information on how to connect with different groups. And you can also look online and find different groups in your area. Another piece of advice I have, something that helps me if I'm experiencing a little bit of a block, is I'll find a poem and sometimes I'll just choose at random by another writer. And I'll take one line from that poem and then I write my poem. And then you can either use that line as um, a quote at the beginning of your poem. Make sure to always quote the poet that you're um, that you're um, using um, if they're, you're you're using their work. Or sometimes you can cross out the line, and then you just have your poem, and nobody will ever know unless you tell them that you were inspired by that line, but you know, and it's a wonderful way to get into a poem and into your own inspiration. Lovely. Right, poems exist in community just as much as poets do, right? Yeah. Yes. 
Um, all right, we have another question from someone in our audience. Um, Karen, all of your poems are powerful and speak the truth. One poem in particular, Bounce, made me lose my breath after reading it aloud. Was that poem hard to write and share with your readers? And I think we can broaden this for everyone too. Like, have you had poems that have been, um, the process of writing them has maybe felt like emotionally difficult or even like intellectually difficult and how you stay driven to put that poem on paper, even if it's painful. The poem Bounce, which is about marital rape, was extremely hard to write. And also it was a very important poem for me to write. It felt very liberating and scary at the same time to write a poem about that subject. When it was uh, first published in a literary journal, I thought, okay, these editors are being really brave too. The poem was rejected, I can't even tell you how many times when I would submit it to magazines and literary journals, people would not, editors I should say, would not publish it. And I wondered if it was because of the subject, but then it was uh, published and um, now it's also in my first full length collection. So thanks for asking that question. And there are resources for people who are experiencing domestic violence. There are ways to get to safety and get out. If you need to get out of a domestic violence situation, it's very important, even if you feel stuck, to speak out go to somebody that you trust and take those steps. Again, the library of all things is a great place to go for resources. And when you are in a situation like that, you are the one being abused. It's nothing to be ashamed of yourself. Even if you feel shame, it's the other person who's causing the harm and you have every right to create safety for yourself and anyone else affected. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I wonder, um, do our other poets um, have experiences, yeah, with writing something that reflects an extremely difficult experience or just the process that it was difficult, but you felt it was important to still do? More optional, because it might not. <laughs> can say something so whenever um so that i think the sensitivity of poet is so high that even um other people go through that experience you feel it and you it touches your heart so seeing suffering around you also kind of motivates you to write something because that's a sublimation like you have to write it so it comes out of you so and it's a relief and liberating as um you mm -hmm. said and um uh, when you are going through through suffering, then also writing that poem, it's so tough. Like you're going through a lot of, everybody has their own journey, ups and downs. So if you're high, being loved, you will write that. If you're rejected, that that you write down. So it's a journey. It's it's a peep into a poet's heart. I think poets do it more for themselves sometimes. Um, and also it is good for others and everybody else to realize what everybody's going through. So then it adds perspective to life because it's such a polarizing world and everything stimulates you and being human and just being, touching the emotions and the heart is so important. So I think poets can do that. It's so, it's a change that we can bring, I think. And when people listen to us or even if they are feeling the same thing, I think that's mission accomplished. Like... <laughs> Yeah. What did I read? There's some quote that's like, believe in what you have to write because your words are in the shape of someone else's wound. I yeah. think they'll, they'll need to find it. I'm really badly paraphrasing that, but that's the idea. Julie, I don't know if you have a response to this or there's another question that's also specifically for you in the comments. Um, there, uh, Jolt is a collection of gorgeously felt love poems. 
what is your approach for tackling the love poem and how do you write a love poem in a fresh way? And I think we can definitely broaden this question to everyone too. Hi, Paula. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, you know, I, I, I always, when I started, well, when I came back to writing in 2018, that was one of the only types of poems I didn't write because I thought, oh, it's so difficult to write good love poems that aren't cliche or that aren't, you know, a copy of other ones or, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's just, just trying to avoid sort of these images, these cliche images and to use very specific details and imagery to that situation. So as opposed to using like um sort of all this abstract imagery, so real things in the scene. So in one of mine, a, a bocadillo or, you know, things that people can see rather than sort of using abstract, abstract uh, images. It's really hard to explain. I don't know. <laughs> but I think avoiding cliche is the most an important thing. If you, if I write a line, I go, oh, that, that sounds like something everybody else has said, or I've, I've seen that too many times, then I change it. Just try to come up with unusual, unusual images. I don't know if I explained myself very well. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think so. That, and those un unusual images come from reflecting the specifics yeah. of your lived experience, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Karen or Prague, yeah, do you have thoughts about love poems? Um, yeah, like Julie, it's hard to explain um, how you write it and how love comes to you. Sometimes you think it's love, it's not love. Sometimes you do find love. So it is like, um, and sometimes you build on it, like you write the first line and you don't know what the last line will be. So um, I would say like, um, even when I read a poem about love, I feel that emotion and I feel so loved myself. And sometimes I think poets are in love with idea of love, like being in love, like that idea kind of um, does that. So I think I can't say much. I just <laughs> it's hard to, to explain. Yeah. Yeah, Karen, do you have a love love poem experience? Oftentimes when I write a love poem, it's not about romantic love. I've written about romantic love too, but you can write a love poem about a subject that is not a romantic subject. It could become a romantic love poem, oddly enough, but sometimes it's a love poem about the love that you experienced for someone or something else that's not romantic. For example, Julie just mentioned a book of the year. And now I'm super hungry because I'm thinking <laughs> about the wonderful Boca Dios in Spain. And I may just have to write a love poem, an ode to a Boca Dio. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, an ode. Odes are love poems, right? I love that too. All right, we have another uh, question from a patron, maybe our last question. We'll see you on time. But um, what is your favorite kind of poem? If there is an answer to that, maybe like a form that you feel drawn to or um, like poem, a subject matter you feel drawn to, however you interpret favorite kind of poem. You want to have a, an immediate favorite? Yeah. Bonda, I, Villanelle. I, I, can, no. <laughs> I can say something about that. Yeah, I used to write Villanelle's um, growing up because I was modeling myself at that point after Sylvia Plath, who mm. wrote a lot of Villanelle's. And then I tried to move to sonnets. I felt um, that I was pretty terrible at sonnets because I wasn't getting the meter right. Growing into my own voice, and I think this is important, I realized the meter doesn't matter as much in modern poetry in the same way. You don't have to necessarily do it in iambic pentameter. You can mix things up and should. It's actually better for the poem and the reader ultimately to have things stirred up. So if you're writing a poem in form like uh, Villanelle 
a sonnet, mix things up a bit, make it fun for you and for your reader. Mm -hmm. Favorite forms? <laughs> um, another question we have, um, how do you use line breaks or enjambment? Uh, punctuation and other syntax, or um, that syntax means the order of words um, to create meaning. So how do you use line breaks, punctuation, or other syntax to create meaning? Or do you? How do you? <laughs> Julie, do you have an answer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, I think it's something that sort of happens naturally organically. I mean, it's to, to, I mean, for example, with line breaks, sometimes I like to break the line uh, when something surprising is going to happen starting in the next line, for example. Um, I'm a teacher, so my punctuation is or tries to be perfect because uh, just grammar and punctuation to me is very important. So um, I, I try to use correct pronouns. Um, punctuation and capitalization. So I personally, I don't use punctuation as much to create meaning. Um, but yeah, the line breaks, I think, are really important. Um, and it's, it's hard to talk about because you, you just sort of do it. It happens. But um, yeah, does anyone else have anything to add? <laughs> I don't think I published it yet, but I do have a poem in draft where I played with the idea of it, the word enjambment. Mm -hmm. And it was something like, I'm not good at even quoting myself. Tonight we eat bread with jam meant for the next morning. And so jam <laughs> is the last word. And then the next um, line starts with meant. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, that's great. Um, and then maybe this will be our last question if we don't have other answers. Um, do you have a muse? Mm -hmm. Maybe a jellyfish in a lagoon is a muse. But yeah, do you have a, a muse? <laughs> I have a few muses. <laughs> yeah, and Karen knows this. Obviously, Adrian Rich is, is quite a muse for me. Um, Prince. Mm. Prince is a huge, 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 huge. I've written a lot of, of poems for and about Prince. And also my um, my late university professor mentor, Virginia. I, I feel like she's always there with me when I'm writing and she's in the words that I write. So those are my three, I would say. Lovely. Pragya or Karen, do you have a muse? Mm, okay, I can go. So muse, um, I cannot think of anything like that. Uh, what I, I have been like, uh, whatever comes to me, touches my emotions or touches my heart, um, that kind of uh, flows. So that's one thing. I sometimes get uh, amused and mused by current events. And uh, that trigger me, beat pandemic, it was like tough. So that triggered some of my poems. Uh, sometimes um, it is like um, how the world is around you that triggers the way you want it to be or the way it's not or whatever. So I think it's mostly current events or from the heart, yeah. Like your own, your own heart's guidance. Yeah. <laughs> Karen, do you have a muse? I have different creative muses that have inspired me throughout my life and continue to different poets, different artists, musicians. And then I also have what I can refer to, I guess, as shadow muses. These uh, people and experiences that come up again and again that continue to inspire my work. Oddly, by being there, even as shadow muses, it sounds very negative, but it becomes a positive experience because it turns that experience on its head and ends up becoming part of the create, creative journey and experience, and then ends up providing 
other people with hopefully this is the the thought with the support and knowing that they're not alone and that's very important so the shadow then becomes light i love that the shadow becomes light i think that's a beautiful note to end on here um thank you all for joining us this morning thank you to our panelists for this wonderful reading and conversation i feel very inspired um, by this discussion um, please check out our upcoming author talks at San Mateo County Libraries at smcl.org slash author talks. They are all virtual and are also recorded on our YouTube, so you can check them up there. We would also appreciate it if you could tell us how SMCL did with this program at smcl.org slash rate this event, which I've just linked you to. Um, and besides that, we are done for this morning. Have a lovely rest of your day, everyone, or evening for those uh, in Europe <laughs> or far away. Um, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>